this segment I'm going to talk about the first book of the Iliad and the eleventh book of the Odyssey, with some reference to the ninth book of the Iliad, which is also extraordinarily important in connection with these things, all constructing the beginning of this constellation that we can call the ethical critique of Homeric epic. And obviously one of the things we're going to do moving on down through this module, and this will happen in the third segment of this module, is talk about how that ethical critique does or does not come through in some form in video games. Um, obviously I'm going to suggest that it does, and I think it'll be very interesting to kind of tease out exactly how the analogies can be made, because as I said in the um, Aristea section, they're going to be a little bit unexpected, I think, and it'll lead to some kind of unexpected work and assignments uh, for you, um, above all in the area of the observation of gamer forums, which is where one of the big analogies, I think, with the ethical critique of Homeric epic comes in. Anyway, let's just talk about Iliad 1, Odyssey 11 in broad terms, and then I'll focus in specifically. Iliad 1, obviously, is the book that sets up the entire big theme of the whole 24-book Iliad, that is, the wrath of Achilles, the anger that Achilles conceives after Agamemnon, at least in Achilles' mind, dishonors him by threatening to take away the prizes of somebody, and then specifically after Achilles stands up and says, no, Agamemnon says, well, yes, now I'm going to take away your prize. Uh, that is Briseis, who's a girl, uh, and the question of how much we're supposed to think of uh, the taking away of and giving back of girls as being something that is kind of in itself objectionable is always up for debate and probably changes over the course of the Iliads coming together. In any case, Agamemnon says, okay, yes, I'm going to take away your girl, because my girl got taken away, which is the whole setup, and Achilles says, well then, I'm not going to fight for you anymore. And later this leads in the ninth book of the Iliad to the famous formulation about how his mother, Thetis, who's a sea goddess, how his mother told him that he has those two destinies, the one where if he stays at Troy, he'll die, but his kleos, that is, his glory or his fame, will live forever. Or, if he, st um, if he doesn't stay at Troy, if he decides to go home, he'll have a very long life, but his gleos will be gone. He won't have any glory, nobody will ever talk about him again. That, of course, all gets set up in the first book of the Iliad, where he sits out of battle. The next few books are introducing us to the problems that this creates for the Achaeans. Again, that's the Greeks, they're also called the Danaeans, but they're Agamemnon's armed forces, um, the problems that this causes for the Achaeans, um, and also what's going on in the Trojan camp and what it means especially to Hector, the great Trojan hero whose name means the holder, who is trying to hold the whole of the Trojan affair together. Uh, and that, of course, happens above all in Book 6 of the Iliad, when we see Hector saying farewell to Andromache, his wife, and Astyanax, his son, at the very end of the book, which gets us to be obviously sympathetic for Hector. But it all sets up in Iliad 1 with this quarrel between Agamemnon and Achilles, in which we see Agamemnon, great general, great overlord, owner of the biggest armed forces, brother of Menelaus, who's the owner of the most wealth. We see him counterposed to Achilles. Achilles, the best of all, a very young warrior, a very hot-headed warrior, and yet a guy with whom we, I think, all can sympathize. And I think everybody at the Bardic occasions on which the first book of the Iliad would have been sung, and worth remembering that each Bardic occasion was probably a time to sing about one book, as we now have it, of the Iliad. Anyway, in this quarrel in Book 1 of the Iliad, we have Achilles and Agamemnon opposed to one another. And this picks up on something that's right there at the very end of what's called the Proem, the first ten lines or so of the Iliad, in which it finishes, tell me from the time when, tell me goddess, from the time when the son of Atreus and brilliant Achilles stood quarreling. Um, so, the manus comes from the quarrel, and the quarrel is a time when we see two models 
of what it means to be a hero counterposed. Um, Agamemnon, the general, Achilles, the brilliant warrior, and somebody's going to get hurt. Now, it ends up, of course, being the Achaeans, and that, I think, is a huge part of the ethical critique of the Iliad, that when Agamemnon and Achilles quarrel, when Achilles develops his wrath, the people who suffer are actually the Achaeans. And one very likely etymology of Achilles' name is he who brings pain to the people. So there's obviously in the minds of the audience and of the bard this idea that the um, quarrel between Agamemnon and Achilles is a way of thinking about what it means to be a good warrior and what it means also to be a good person and that's going to be the thing that I call ethical critique going forward. The idea that you can make a critique, you can make a judgment between two versions or multiple versions because there are many different kinds of heroes. Odysseus hasn't even come into our discussion yet. A judgment between many different kinds of person as to which one you want to be. And this is, among other things, the beginning of philosophy, because Socrates, when he's active uh, in the 400s BCE, at the end of the 5th century BCE, is thinking precisely about this. And he is, in some of the dialogues we have from Plato, modeling himself after Achilles, and very often counterposing that version of Achilles to Odysseus, who's the person we see in Odyssey 11, and, of course, this is why the Iliad comparison becomes all the more interesting when it gets kind of played over and over in other stories. Because in Book 11 of the Odyssey, we have Odysseus in the underworld, and he runs into Achilles. Now, one thing to say, as we'll talk about in other contexts in this course, I believe that Odysseus is supposed to be thought to be making it all up as he goes along, these stories about his adventures. But you don't really have to accept that as long as you understand the bard as making it up for a good reason. In any case, whether Odysseus is making up this story or the bard is making up the story, Odysseus runs into Achilles and here's what happens.